For your viewing pleasure, this broadcast of the Municipal Council Meeting of Alpena is made possible by the funding provided by the City of Alpena. Thank you for your generosity. Good evening and welcome to the Alpena City Council meeting of July 1st, 2019. Call the order, please. Huss? Here. Johnson? Here. Nielsen? Yes. Nowak? Here. And Walgora? Here. Please rise for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, modifications to the agenda tonight. I would like to add a, um, a workshop after closed session for the just to go over the community profile for city manager. So moved. Second. Hess? Yes. Johnson? Yes. Nielsen? Yes. Nowak? Yes. And Walgra? What? Motion carried. <clears throat> Any other modifications tonight? Okay, approval of the meeting, uh, minutes for regular and closed sessions of June 17th, 2019. Any changes or issues? Citizens be uh, appearing before council on agenda or not agenda items are allowed five minutes each to address your concerns. If you'd like to do so, please come to the podium and state your name and address for our records. And this is the only time during tonight's wow, meeting up, so that uh, you're allowed to address council. Hey, Dan Mitchell, 221 West Park Street, here in Alpena. Um, I don't know how many of you have been out to the Dan Shell to enjoy the concerts just like this. And I work with uh, Cooking for a Cause for the past two weeks just like this. And one of the biggest questions we've been asked is, where are our flags? There are no flags, especially when the city band is playing the national anthem. However, Dana Howard, which is the scoutmaster for the city scouts like this, brings his own flag in there to hang just so they can have a flag there. So hopefully we will, if it hasn't been addressed, it will be taken care of. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. We will do that. Uh, I know it takes a boom truck to hang those flags, so mm -hmm. Rich looks like he's taking notes. All right. Thank you, Dan. Anyone else? On a consent agenda this evening, A is bills to be allowed in the amount of $580,451.12. B is a noise variance until midnight on August 17, 2019 for Chiefs Bar and Grill located at 626 North 2nd Avenue. And for clarity, I'd like to also add that they'll be closing the first block of Lake Street as they normally do for their events. C is a noise variance until midnight on July 13, 2019 for Joe's Bar located at 1300 Ford Avenue. And D is a rally to save the children in detention centers by the people for social justice on July 12, 2019. <coughs> I move we approve the consent agenda as presented. Second. Johnson? Yes. Nielsen? Yes. Nowak? Yes. Polagora? Aye. And Hess? Yes. Motion carried. Thank you. Presentations. Tonight we have a presentation by Mary Egan of the Here and Humane Society on the city agreement compliance issue. Uh, let me start by thanking the city of Alpena for not only valuing the work of the Huron Humane Society in spirit, but by also continuing to maintain a service contract with HHS to house, treat, and care for dogs and cats brought to the HHS shelter in the city of Alpena. Sometimes people forget we are in the city of Alpena. We do have an unpaved road. We should talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> only we knew someone. Anyway. Um, <clears throat> we at HHS are very proud to be Alpena's no-kill animal shelter, serving the community for nearly 40 years, and it's an honor to be in a partnership with the city, something that we never take for granted. When I spoke with you in January, <coughs> I detailed how 2018 was a record year for the number of animals serviced by the Huron Domain Society. HHS took in 621 animals last year, which was almost three times the number of dogs and cats who came to HHS in 2017. Now, as 2019 dawned, we never dreamed we'd be taking in as many animals as last year. 
but I stand before you today to report that we are on pace to take in even more dogs and cats than in 2018, which is astonishing and indicative of the problem Alpina has with an overabundance of uh, excess unaltered animals, mostly cats, unfortunately. Through June of 2018, HHS had taken in 161 animals. This is last year, 79 of which were from the city of Alpena. <coughs> Through June of this year, HHS has already taken in 251 animals, 111 of which are from the city of Alpena. To be up 90 animals overall this year over last with the dreaded second wave of kitten season still to come in the late summer to early fall is sobering to say the least. HHS continues, though, to have stellar adoption rates. That is the good news. With 198 of the 251 animals we've served at the shelter this year so far being adopted and 28 returned to their owners, we are heartened that because of the support of the city of Alpena, 251 animals who have resided at our shelter within the city limits this year have been tested, treated, vaccinated, and either have been or will be surgically sterilized which will pay huge dividends in the community for years to come. The Huron Humane Society has had a goal this year to improve how we carry out our mission, which is to use no-kill solutions to reduce the number of homeless cats and dogs in Alpena County through education, rehabilitation, and rehoming with the support and cooperation of the community. Now, most people, when reading our mission statement, focus on the first part, which details what HHS as an organization does. Sometimes they skip the last part of the mission, which puts some of the responsibility of saving those homeless, neglected, abandoned, and abused animals back on the community. HHS simply cannot exist or carry out our mission without the support and cooperation of the community, so we've made a concerted effort this year to build more bridges in the community to improve our services, which will ultimately improve the lives of the animals in our community. Great example of a new bridge we built in cooperation with the community is the mutually beneficial relationship we've strengthened with Northeast Michigan Trap Neuter Return, whose mission is to help control the feral cat population in Northeast Michigan, which is a major problem here in the city of Alpena, especially in the trailer parks. That has been a big problem. The executive committee of the Huron Humane Society recently met with the president of TNR to forge an agreement to work together to help get tame homeless cats and kittens off the streets and into loving homes after being spayed or neutered. While TNR's mission does not involve tame cats or rehoming, they occasionally find tame cats in their live traps or more commonly come across newborn kittens in the wild. When either of these scenarios happen, HHS has agreed to take cats and kittens from TNR as space allows at the shelter. This ensures that tame cats TNR come across are either returned to their homes where they may have escaped, things happen, or a process through the HHS shelter where we can guarantee that they will be tested, vaccinated, and altered so those cats don't continue the reproductive cycle that contributes to the feral cat population. This relationship with TNR allows us both to carry out our respective missions responsibly, which is to the great benefit of the animals involved, not to mention the community at large. Though the Huron Humane Society is no longer in contract with the County of Alpena, we have been in contact with the county and hope to have some good news in the near future. In the meantime, the county's animal control deputy recently contacted HHS to ask that we take animals currently at her small facility, which is full. Today, our manager went to the facility to assess the animals and accepted the ones we are able to accommodate at HHS for now. We are always happy to help save an animal's life and look forward to future collaborations like this with the county when possible. In the meantime, HHS always welcomes strays dropped off at the shelter and promptly notifies the dog catcher when the strays that come in are dogs as notified by the, excuse me, as directed by the sheriff. The city police have been great to work with when they are the law enforcement entity that brings in strays and we're always very happy to work with the city in any capacity. Speaking of which, HHS continues to bring adoptable cats to the City Hall on Mondays for public meet and greets, and many adoptions have taken place as a result. Thank you to City staff for contending with rambunctious kittens and neurotic cats. You've been wonderful partners in our adoption pushes. Another important part of engaging the community at large so they can hold up their part of the HHS mission is to make the Huron Humane Society shelter a more pleasant, welcoming place to visit. We want the public to feel excited about coming to the shelter and not dread it. 
To put it bluntly, the place used to stink. It was a depressing place to visit sometimes. It was dirty sometimes. It was unprofessional looking. And yes, it holds animals, and that's going to happen. But we really want to stay on top of it to make sure that the shelter is as welcoming as possible. Things have changed dramatically at the shelter, and we want everyone here tonight to come visit us. This year, the HHS board has worked hard to improve the building as staff stays busy caring for the animals. We've refinished the floors, painted and furnished the lobby, reception and adoption center, and the executive director's office. We worked with other volunteers to expand vertical space in the cat colonies and installed catwalks on the walls. We spoke with a feline veterinarian to get suggestions to keep our cat populations healthy and as a result, installed stress-reducing feline pheromone diffusers in all feline areas and even put in Alexa-enabled Amazon Echo Dots to play soothing music throughout the shelter. They like jazz, by the way. The cats really like jazz. Um, we used the $5,000 grant awarded to HHS from the Community Foundation for Northeast Michigan to construct a very well-stocked veterinary care room at the shelter. We're in the process of grinding down rusted kennel doors and kennel bases and sealing them. We're putting in new floors and canine intake and in the bathroom, and we're replacing five urine stain doors with new doors. We're painting the laundry room, an employee lounge, and we purchased a new lawnmower. <coughs> well, part of the society service contract with the city is to improve and upgrade the shelter facility, HHS would be doing this work on our shelter anyway, not only to improve the environment our animal guests are in during their time with us, but to attract the people in our community who will ultimately adopt the homeless animals we care for every single day. Once again, thank you so, so much to the City of Alpena, its staff and management for supporting and valuing the work of the Huron Humane Society and the animals that we serve. And we have a short video just to show folks a little bit of the improvements at the shelter. So if you haven't been there in a while, this is something that you may find interesting. <laughs>
you very much. We really do appreciate it. Any questions? <coughs> no. Please come out and visit the animals. If anyone's a cat, Thank you very much. I'm hypnotized by that music. <laughs> All right, we are down now to report to officers the service and project agreements and budget amendment. Okay, that's me. Yeah. That's me. Uh, it has become standard practice for the city to enter in individual service agreements with organizations that council has directed budgeted funding to. For the 2019-20 fiscal year, funding has been allocated to Target Alpena Development Corporation and the Huron Humane Society. Uh, major changes in the their agreements are as follows for target the only change was in the scope of services the first bullet point has been expanded to include the redevelopment of the John Henry Antique Mall and the securing of a tenant for the former Ripley Street Station property as priority efforts uh, the HHS agreement got a little more complicated as I was preparing this I decided I would check the budget just to make sure I was correct with the fact that when we did the budget, uh, and I did my budget letter to you, I stated in there that we had increased the amount of funding from by $3,000. But when I looked at the budget, it wasn't there. So uh, this initially, what had happened was initially we had budgeted $5,000 for Northern Lights Arena and seventeen for HHS. Once it was determined that funding to Northern Lights did not comply with the Attorney General's guidance on governmental donations to nonprofits, that funding was eliminated in the budget. It was my intent to utilize 3,000 of that deleted amount to increase HHS's funding to 20,000. Uh, it's been 17 for many years. And, but due to a miscommunication during the budget process and my mistake, first in assuming the change had been done and second in not checking it out before the budget went to you, it was inadvertently left out. To make matters worse, my budget letter, as I said, specifically stated that the funding had been increased. It is still staff's recommendation that the HHS funding be at the $20,000 level for 2019 uh, through 20. Consequently, if council concurs, the attached budget amendment will need to be approved, increasing the HHS funding to $20,000 with the additional monies coming from the fund balance. No other significant changes were made in the agreement. Additionally, you have a what I now call a project agreement because it's not really a service agreement with the Thunder Bay uh, Arts Council. Uh, that is for the sculptures. Uh, we, this will be our second year, I think, of doing it. And it's really not a service agreement but more of a bricks and mortar project. So that's also in there. It has not changed from before, uh, just the dates and that have been altered. None of these agreements have been approved by the appropriate boards, mainly because I kind of was tardy in getting them put together and they didn't have a chance to do it before coming to you. However, we do not foresee any problem with that occurring in a timely fashion, so consequently staff requested all three agreements be approved along with the budget amendment for HHS. Once approved by all parties, the first quarterly payments will be made following the second council meeting in July. All right, that's understandable. Um, and if no questions or issues with that, I would assume we will move to approve each service agreement individually and then the budget. budget. So all four, yeah, you need four motions. Um, yeah. So the service, let's, let's just do the HHS one first, and will we approve the service agreement uh, here in the main society? Second. So that would also be to approve the budget amendment? No, we'll do that. We'll do that. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, Nielsen? Yes. Noah? Yes. Paul Agora? Aye. Hess? Yes. And Johnson? Yes. Motion carried. Right. Let's approve the target uh, service agreement. And and we'll we, go ahead. Move to renew the service agreement with Target. Second. Nowak? Yes. Walgora? Aye. Haas? Yes. Johnson? Yes. And Nielsen? Yes. Motion Sorry. carried. Okay, and then the project agreement for Thunder Bay Arts Council. 
I move to renew the service agreement with Thunder Bay Arts Council. Project agreement? Oh, part target, I'm sorry. Project. Project agreement. Project, project, project. Okay. project. okay. Second. Walgora? Uh, Hess? Yes. Johnson? Yes. Nielsen? Yes. And Nowak? Yes. Motion carried. And uh, the budget amendment. I move we approve the budget amendment as requested. Second. Hess? Yes. Johnson? Yes. Nielsen? Yes. Nowak? Yes. And Walgora? All right. Motion carried. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, unfinished business. A is the rezone the property located at 124 and 128 South First Avenue from OS1 Office Service District to R2 One Family Resident District. Second reading of the ordinance 19 446. Consistent with council policy, I would not read this again unless specifically requested by one of you. You just need a, a vote yes or no. Very tempting to have to do it again. <laughs> self-explanatory so uh, hearing no other questions I move we approve ordinance 19-446 second Johnson yes Nielsen yes Nowak yes Walgora aye and Hess yes motion carried thank you that's good Next up is the syringe service program, and we've been asked by law enforcement to table that until the uh, July 15th meeting. And I, unless someone has any uh, issues with that, I uh, let the uh, health department know as well, which is why they're not here. I have no issues with that, so, so moved. Second. Nielsen? Yes. Black? Yes. Balgora? Aye. Yes. and Johnson. Yes. Okay. And here we are again. New business? New business. The 2019 resurfacing project bid. On June 25th, uh, 2019, the city received an open bids for the 2019 resurfacing project, which includes, but is not limited to, cold milling and hot mix asphalt surfacing. Bids were sent to 10 firms as well as posted on the city's website with one bid received as follows. It was from Everett Goodrich Trucking, the amount of $142,306. The city currently has $165,000 budget for this project, which includes resurfacing First Avenue from Chisholm Street to Richardson Street. Based on review of, the, of Goodrich's bids, bid and the as-bid price calculations below the engineer's estimate for the project, it is my recommendation to city engineer to award the 2019 resurfacing project to Goodrich Trucking for the as bid unit price is totaling one hundred and forty two thousand three hundred six dollars. One thing we may do, um, and we, I want to get into the project a little bit, we may try to utilize the balance of that funding between the one hundred forty two three hundred six and the one hundred sixty five thousand we have budgeted to try to do one more block on First Avenue, if we can. We can't do the whole block, I'm just I'm gonna just hold it until the following year then, but like I said, I wanna see, once we get into the project a little bit and see where we're at on it, so. Sounds good. Uh, just one quick comment too, um, on an unrelated, with uh, every good route struggle. <coughs> I just passed the words along that they did a great job on Second Avenue. Having working the work down there, uh, it was a mess, but it was only a mess for a day and a half. Uh, the guys were very focused, and uh, they really got it done quickly. So all of those uh, merchants, I'm sure, would appreciate it. And I know that being in the office down there too, it was, it was a fantastic job, and it was, it was quick. It was nice to see that open up so fast. So please pass. It was a good comment so along. As far as uh, this bid, I have no questions. Question. I move we approve the bid for the uh, resurfacing. resurfacing project to Ever Goodrich Trucking in the amount of one hundred forty-two thousand three hundred six. Second. Thank you. Do you need it added to the to the uh, motion that you'll you'll use the rest of the budgeted money for another block if you can or it's just, that, that would be good if we did that. Why don't you add that? With the can. with the balance of the projected project to be used in an additional block if if possible. Second. 
Chalk? Yes. Walgora? Aye. Huss? Yes. Johnson? Yes. And Nielsen? Yes. Ocean Carry. All right. Thank you, sir. Next up is the Heron Pine Source Water Intake Protection Plan. The city, in cooperation with the Michigan Rural Water Association, recently completed a Source Water Intake Protection Plan, SWIP, update. The following executive summary explains the SWIP, and I copied this because it's a lot easier <coughs> than trying to explain it, but... Uh, in 1996, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency established a new requirement under Section 1453 of the 1996 Safe Drinking Water Act for each state to develop a source water assessment and production program to assess all public drinking water supply sources. SWAP has two components, assessment protection. The assessment component was mandatory with US EPA and all states were required to provide source water assessment reports to federally defined public water supply systems. The second component, Protection is voluntary and consists of developing a source water intake protection plan. This SWIP plan will, one, define roles uh, and duties of government units and water supply agencies, designate a source water protection area for each water supply uh, source based on the state's defined source water area, identify potential contaminant sources within each source water protection area, utilize management approaches for protection of source water, including but not limited to education and regulatory approaches, creating contingency plans for public water supply sources, including the location of alternate drinking water sources, and investigate the potential for new sources and encourage public participation. This document, and it, it's been a year and a half to two years in the making, is, is several inches thick. Like I said, it was, it was a partnership. Um, Mike Collins from the Water Plant, a uh, group of public uh, of citizens, and the Michigan Rural Water Association developed it. And it's a requirement that we can submit. Um, and, and what is, we're looking at beyond the city. This covers the entire uh, Thunder Bay River watershed area. Um, you know, we have. We can control some of the activities that take place in the city, but we don't have the, the tools to go outside of the city um, to do that, to try to protect that source water. Um, about the same time that the, the, the source water intake protection plan was finished, I got a call from Huron Pines, um, and they had received a grant receive grant funding to initiate conversations with coastal communities about stormwater management along with a small portion of funding to assist in the initial efforts. One of the efforts of the collaboration between Huron Pines and Alpena will be to outline goals and to work with the city of Alpena to figure out how to fund projects or programs uh, you would need for ideal stormwater management. Staff has met with Huron Pines to discuss utilizing their resources to assist the city in various aspects of the SWEP, including identifying potential contaminant sources, identifying stormwater outfalls, and contributing drainage areas, and public education. These are all activities that the city would need to undertake in conjunction with other ongoing work and would likely be done over a long period of time. By utilizing Huron Pines resources, we can accomplish this work in a shorter time period. As stated, here on Pines has received grant funding for their ongoing work related to the source water protection. And the city uh, would participate in costs as needed uh, with the $5,000 that was established in the current budget for source water protection out of our water fund. It's my recommendation to city engineer that we work with Huron Pines toward meeting portions of our source water intake protection plan as outlined. And Huron Pines is here. Uh, they've got a short presentation, so. Sure, a little bit of overlap we didn't exchange <laughs> notes very well, but <laughs> I'm Samantha Nellis, I'm with Your Own Pines. Um, just give you kind of an overview of our stormwater uh, program and, and what we bring to the table here. So 
For everyone, here on Pines is an environmental conservation nonprofit based out of Gaylord. We've been around since 1973, um, working to protect forests, lakes, and streams, um, and uh, working with our the communities in our region to help um, foster environmental stewardship. And so uh, we do have three main focus programs, the first being healthy water, um, protected places. Uh, we have a new preserve uh, just on the north side of Long Lake, uh, so we're pretty excited about all that. Um, and then helping to build vibrant communities. So just so we're all on the same page, um, when we looked at the the source water intake protection plan, um, a lot of it has to do with the runoff that's coming from the land. So when I say storm water, what I'm talking about is rainfall and snow melt that flows over lawns, construction sites, right, roads, rooftops. Uh, it doesn't infiltrate into the ground and it'll go right into our uh, storm drain system or directly into the lake. Why this is an issue, uh, this picks up salt and dirt, oil, fertilizer, pet waste, uh, and brings a lot of pollutants into our water, which is one of the main concerns in Alpino, right, is because we get the drinking water right from that uh, Thunder Bay. Uh, we also have issues with this um, as we have more and more impervious surfaces. Uh, that water moves a lot faster. Uh, this is, can cause erosion and it increases the risk of flash floods. So several concerns when we have areas that are becoming more and more urbanized. Um, and the main goal when we look at this is the more we can keep out of the storm drains, the better. So we're looking at improving the quality of water that goes into those storm sewer drains and into the water, but also um, reducing the amount. So our approach to this um, is we would build off of some of the existing information in that SWIP uh, to build a Alpena stormwater assessment. So one of the first things, and I put this example from Roger City up, um, it's kind of hard to see the outfalls on the screen, but uh, we delineate exactly what um, areas are draining into each of those outfalls uh, so we can assess uh, the biggest impacts of, of where our pollution is coming from and, and how we can address those. Um, we also estimate all of those water volumes and pollutant loadings um, from, from all of those zones. And then that stormwater assessment would also identify those high impact target areas and recommend best management practices throughout the city so we can <coughs> address water quality. So when I'm talking about best management practices, a lot of this um, is hard to do sometimes with one of the biggest impacts we can have is preserving natural areas. Um, so it's naturally filter out our water um, and help build resiliency in coastal communities. Uh, we also have a extensive community outreach and education program related to stormwater. So we would definitely be targeting that. I know that's a strong uh, recommendation within the source water protection um, intake protection plan. Uh, green infrastructure. So this is managing that stormwater runoff using natural processes. So these can be rain gardens, bioswales, vegetative bu buffers. Um, they are more and more proving to be both economical and highly effective, um, especially in coastal areas. So there's a lot of money coming from a lot of different places to put into green infrastructure development. So it can be in new development pro um, projects, but also retrofitted um, around the city to really divert some of this water that's coming off of um, impervious surfaces. Um, into those and it serves as a filtration, storage, and slowing down that flow. So a lot of uh, different <coughs> benefits there. Other things could include strategic street sweeping to get a lot of that oil and grid off, um, city ordinance reviews, um, and gray infrastructure such as oil and grid separators and, um, near the outfalls. Um, so beyond just uh, drinking water benefits, I think there are some, um, some economic benefits, I, I, well with the drinking water, uh, 
with less filtering. Um, there's a lot of ecological benefits to these things, bringing in uh, wildlife habitat and uh, diversity of plants. Um, aesthetics, we can make a lot of these things really green up the city, they look nice. Um, and then that community um, vibrancy aspect, bringing in community members to help address these issues. So, just to tell you a little bit more about our funding mechanisms right now, um, we do have funding through the um, Environmental Protection Agency, Environmental Justice Grants. Uh, so, and then we also are leading up the partnership for a Great Lakes One Water Lake Huron um, initiative. So both of these are regional grants um, all across our service area along the coast. And then the Great Lakes One Water also extends up into our <coughs> area. Uh, so what these would cover would be for us to do that stormwater assessment, um, really to, to delineate those zones and, and see what's coming off and where we should target. Uh, community assessment, so identifying some knowledge and skill gaps within the community um, to specifically address that sort of thing. Uh, and then to hold workshops and trainings. So a lot of this is building up some community capacity to support stormwater runoff management in the long term. And then as a nonprofit, we know um, quite a bit about getting grants and, and uh, finding them. So that's a huge part of what we do is help to secure the funding for long-term management of stormwater and the maintenance of any um, infrastructure projects that we might decide on. So we see a lot of overlaps and opportunities to bring our technical experience and our vision for healthy coastal communities to help Alpena meet water quality goals. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. A um, couple questions for you yeah, before you course. take off the... So, you guys are probably, are you pretty confident that, that the grants that you'll be able to garner will cover the assessments and, and plus the funding that you have in this budget year already? Or? Yes, so the, those things specifically we have covered. Oh, okay. To do that assessment, um, the, the stormwater assessment document and the, the background, not, you know, data gathering behind that. Okay. We have, can cover that and that community assessment portion, which um, is written into, um, especially our Great Lakes One Water really wants to gauge community readiness and <coughs> that sort of thing, so that's written in there. Um, and then some of those workshops and trainings. We do um, like to partner. I mean, we think of this as a partnership, so there is some um, reciprocal, you know, <laughs> give and take there for hosting some of these workshops and things like that. Sure. Um, as far as uh, when we identify on the grounds work, I mean, that might be a time when we have to look at some additional funding to get, you know, a green infrastructure project on the ground. Um, but we have a lot of options and experience doing that, so, yeah. yeah. Okay. But that initial planning and, and data gathering, we, we have that. Okay. And then when it comes to actually doing something, um, something like mediation, like the plants and things that you identified yeah. and um, things like that, then we would we find have work together to, to find that sort of yeah. funding. And Rich is well versed in that as well. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we, well. We've actually got grants through, I think Suez got us a, some grants back when we put those plaques on the drains and things like that. Yeah. So. And, you know, it's, uh, it is something that, that, you know, we looked at them as, as providing some of those resources we can do it but it's going to take time away from everything else so you know, you know if we can can work with them and then this is not going to be something that's going to be you know completed yet just in this current budget year you know, so we would be able to look at funding projects in the future those would be funded out of our, out of our water fund uh, just <coughs> that water quality okay how long, I like, like in your experience, obviously, with Roger City, how long does a, an assessment period take? Are we talking ye years for that as well? The assessment or? portion, no. Um, we'd have to talk, but usually those can be completed in a few months, depending on that background knowledge, like some of that GIS. Um, but I know you guys have a lot of, of that in place, so. Yeah. so yeah. 
Okay. As far as the assessment portion. Excellent. Do you need action on that, Rich, or you're just uh, filing? Just, just, <coughs> just we wanted to get that before council so that they, okay. they knew that we were working with here on Pines. Uh, and uh, that, you know, we do have funding budgeted for some small expenses that we may incur for this. So. Excellent. During the closed session, we discuss water and sewer litigation. Second. <laughs> well, Gora? Yes. Johnson? Yes. Nielsen? Yes. Noah? Yes. Motion carried.